talk about, things that happened way back. Uh, internet wasn't around all the time. The first time that I bumped into the internet, or forerunner of the internet, 1973, a chap called Vince Cerf, who you folk might have heard about, he's the guy who invented the TCP IP protocols, went to still ARPANET. He was out in South Africa <coughs> at a computer society conference at the Carlton Center, what was then downtown Johannesburg. Uh, I was there, he did a demonstration, and in those days he had a most fantastic device, an acoustic modem, had to get special permission from Telcom to, well not Telcom, Telcom's forerunner, South African Post and Telecommunications to use it because the regulations were not in favour of using those sort of things. Um, acoustic modem, you dial up, it's a device that looks like a handset and you couple the one thing onto the other so the speaker goes into the whistler and the headphones come from the other whistler at the far end and 300 bits per second that was living and um, I was amazed as this guy navigated around um, the ARPANET in the USA <coughs> while sitting in Joburg and he did this demonstration of logging into this computer then that computer then another computer and I remember explicitly him doing a algebraic manipulation of a fairly simple polynomial and all the folk around didn't know what the hell d dy by dx meant. So. <laughs> but that's what he did and I must say it impressed me. All the experts at the time when you sat around at the sort of coffee breaks were talking about the International St Standards Organization model, seven layer model of open systems interconnection. So ISO and OSI. Whoops, too far. Then, a problem, right? Yeah, first account. Um, in 1988, um, by that stage, I was privileged to have used, had, had to have a guest sign on at University of Delaware. I could access it via the X25 network, which was a very expensive network to use. <coughs> and I could log on to my sign on at University of Delaware and working on command line interface stuff, there was no concept of Windows, um, I could get to sites all around the then internet. And this was absolutely fantastic. And I think that was one reason why I, Rhodes, I was at Rhodes University at the time, IT director, and um, I could download uh, things like RFCs. And we then learned how to use the RFCs when we were working on our email, <coughs> Our email gateways, and um, we were well ahead of, of, of the pack because I could do this. And I was getting experience on using the internet. And then you try to go to someone and say, folk, this is a great idea, why don't we try to get the internet running in this country? And they haven't a clue what you're talking about. Um, in that era, uh, we'd installed a <coughs> a dial-up service, an experimental dial-up service from Rhodes University to University of Potchefstroom. And my friends, now I'm not talking about my enemies, but my friends at the university, Rhodes University, said, what on earth are you wasting the university's money on? Why the hell are you doing this lot? If I want to contact someone at Potch University, I'll send them a fax. But in actual fact, I don't want to contact them because um, you, know, you have to understand the politics of the country at that time. Rhodes University was very much a left-wing organisation, anti-apartheid, pinkos. And um, Potts University certainly had the reputation of being somewhat right-wing. They were actually very, very nice people, but um, <laughs> yeah, the associations weren't very good. The other thing that was around at the time in 88, Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act, um, and I think most South Africans believed that uh, the, the isolation of South Africa was such that even if we had a connection, um, it would get disconnected. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, well, this was against university networking, is that the IT directors at universities had enough trouble trying to control their own users, but they didn't want to let other users from other universities, institutions that they didn't control, come in and meddle on their machines. Anyway, I tried to explain to the UniNet board, UniNet board, the university network at the time, um, it was a pilot network, um, it had a 64 kilobits per second backbone, 
circuits coming down from Joburg, down through Bloemfontein to Eastern Cape to Rhodes University and then branching out to University of Natal Durban and to University of Cape Town. Multi-protocol network, you could carve out different sections of the network to, to run different protocols at different speeds. So I tried to convince the UniNet board that we should at least experiment with um, the TCP IP protocols. And the reaction I got was phenomenal. Uh, forget it. No. And sort of at the close of the debate, um, I said, well, look, you know, we, we all know that in the USA, the universities there are on the TCP IP network. And if the OSI model is really the model of the future, you can bet your bottom dollar that those universities will find a way to migrate from internet protocols to OSI protocols. <coughs> and if they do it, we can do it. And as I say, Medlang Tanda, there was concession that I could get some bandwidth on the backbone. Um, anyway, at the time I also wrote to the International Standards Organization. The address I found was a New York address saying, you yeah, know, how do I find out about these OSI protocols? And dead silence, nothing coming back. Anyway, I spoke about downloading the OFCs. Um, so I could get the, for virtually free, I mean, for the cost of the telecommunications link, um, I, I could get the specs of the internet protocols, or those that I needed. Now, one of the issues around at the time was the business about email. Now, it's, it's pretty obvious today that you go to your email device, it, it used to be a PC, it's now a cell phone or heaven knows what else, an iPad or whatever device you want, um, and the email appears there. But at the time, the email model that existed on UniNet was that if there was going to be inter-university communication, you had to log on to a machine at the CSIR, run a mail system called Genie, and see if you had any mail. Now, uh, that system ran on a control data, uh, a mainframe, um, a, a pretty flexible device, um, but essentially you had to use something like a VT100 terminal to access it, an asynchronous terminal. Um, and this made it a bit awkward for the universities that were running IBM mainframes, and that, I think, was the most popular machine, IBM, Persatel, whatever they called it in those days, because their terminals were synchronous terminals, very expensive synchronous terminals, very good, but very expensive, and they couldn't log into this mail system. So someone at one of those universities wanted to get mail, they had to get another terminal next to their terminal on their desk, and occasionally log into this machine. And that model clearly wasn't workable. But that was the model that was around. And I can remember one of the arguments that I raised um, that the model that I was working on, that, that my target was that mail arrives where you are. Now, okay, it's not to the point of cell phones because they didn't exist at the time. But basically, if you were on an IBM mainframe and someone was on a VAX computer or a Hewlett Packard or a Unix machine and they sent mail to you, that mail arrives in your prof's mailbox on the IBM machine. And that, I think, was one of the groundbreaking events, which seems so trivial now. And I'm actually amazed at the talks that I heard yesterday about all these social networks. I do not use them, okay? So I don't, can't speak with authority. But it seems to me most odd when I was listening to those talks yesterday about these islands of social networks. And, and that's absolutely crazy. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm totally floored by this lot, that if there's 10 or 20 or 30 of them, you've got to go to this one, then that one, then that one, then that one, that one. But we've been through that model. The world's going through it again. I think it's crazy. Anyway, the first attempts at TCP IP, uh, 1990, I think it was about May 1990. Um, having got permission from the UniNet board and having got some bandwidth, it was like 1,200 bits per second, but it was better than nothing. Uh, but that was actually pretty fast in those days. Um, we had a go at linking the, <coughs> the mainframe computers, actually it was the networks, um, between Rhodes University of Cape Town. 
the University of Cape Town was a chap called Chris Pinkham. I think you folk might have. Some folk have heard of him. Oh, yeah. great. Oh, great. Well, anyway, Chris was there. Elder brother. <laughs> Don't know how many brothers he's got. Um, and I mean, Chris was an absolute star. He knew, I'm sure, a lot more about the internet protocols than us at Rhodes, but um, I, I guess we were leaders because we'd done all sorts of other things anyway. Anyway, that, the first link didn't work. So we used a, a package called uh, WinRoot from an outfit called Wollongong. Um, we, 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 I think we paid about 400 rand for it in those days, which was a big hunk out of my budget. Uh, couldn't get support from it. And the impression I had that the folk who sold it to us um, was the sort of organization of that era that would sell you a battleship if you had the right sort of money. You know, with backdoor stuff coming into this country. I'm probably totally wrong on that lot and probably can be sued, but the impression I got was that, because the support was zero. We could not get it to work. We couldn't, and Chris Pinkham couldn't, and if he couldn't, no one could. So <laughs> we just about gave up with that, and someone produced the software called PC Root, public domain software. Now, public domain software in that era was. And the damn thing worked. All you needed was a, what was then a modern PC, a 4.77 megahertz PC. Um, uh, you needed a LAN connection, you needed a serial port, and a floppy drive, and that was it. And you set up the auto exec on the floppy drive to boot up PC root, and you <coughs> configured static routes into it, and this was it. Worked. Amazing. So the first link went down from Rhodes to, to UCT. The second link went to Durban, a chap called Alan Barrett. Some folk might have heard of him, I'm sure. Very good name in the internet industry. And um, we were A4 away. The damn thing worked. And of course, once it started working and a few other universities decided they might reluctantly try it out, we kept getting bugged by phone calls because we were the experts we were seen as the experts. We always had the feeling we were hanging on by our fingernails a little bit ahead of a few other people. Um, and so we gave a few courses on about TCP IP and internet. And if I can drop some names, one of the folk who attended was a chap called Duncan Martin, now CEO of Tenet. He uh, was here yesterday and the day before. Another one was a, a chap called Angus Hay. People might know, Chief Technical Officer of Neotel. Um, there were a couple of others. Mark Elkins, he was here yesterday, just had an open heart up. It was really great to see him and see him fit and well. And um, anyway, there's a long story about those, but, but we gave those and I think that helped to set the tone of internet industry in this country. We then eventually at, at, we, we progressed from having a mail-only system at Rhodes, where Rhodes acted as the gateway, taking mail from, say, the, uh, the, Vax, the, the Hewlett-Packard computer at University of Peter Maritzburg, where it made its way to the machine at Rhodes University. We munged it into a different format and sent it back because it was addressed to the uh, Computer Center for Water Research machine, which was an IBM protocol machine, and our machine could do that protocol conversion, being a control data cyber. And um, so the way that mail flowed from the basement at the University of Peter Maritzburg to the IBM machine a couple of floors above was from the basement via Vitz to Rhodes University through our machine, back via Vitz and back to floor upstairs. It was amazing. Anyway, we, we'd had that in, in place and working, and it, it worked. Uh, we'd had an international gateway working. It was running UCP protocols at the time, but before that was running FIDANET protocols on a, a PC BBS type system. And we were dialing through to a chap called Randy Bush in Portland, Oregon, furthest end of the USA you can get to, and he acted as our, our gateway. Um, I looked up the figures just the other day. Um, we were connected 
on a dial-up line to the USA for about 16 hours of the day. Um, we're running a system called Xenix, operating system called Xenix, SCO Xenix, SCO Xenix, some people, huh? <laughs> wow, you, you're all old. <laughs> Um, it was an alpha version of the TCPIP package. It wasn't even a beta version. Um, so it was TCPIP into that machine and then into UCP dial-up system. And of course, when it hiccuped, we started to get complaints. And looking through my mail archives in preparing for the slot, there was a <laughs> Mike Laurie type comment. Um, Gee, we're getting complaints when it fails. Someone must be using the system. <laughs> And we then realized that we actually couldn't make changes to our system. We couldn't put any improvements or whatever in because you're online 16 hours a day on this dial-up. The poor machine is battling to batch and to unbatch the mail packages that it's received, the bundles of mail that it's received on UUCP. And the techies, uh, Jacko, Jacko Guillermo, still at Rhodes University, Dave Wilson in the USA, there was no time in the day, even if they were willing to work any hours of the day, that that machine was, that we could have tuned anything more on that machine. It became quite a problem. Um, around about the June, July area of 91, we tried to get a leased line. Now, it wasn't in my hands, but that stage was in the hands of the late Vic Shaw, who was the manager of Uninet. He had good connections at what was then SAPT. It became Telcom only in September 91. And Telcom, SAPT refused point black to install a leased line to Randy Bush. Why, I do not know. They quoted third party traffic laws and heaven knows what laws, regulations. We were paying like 90,000 Rand a month was the bill on the telephone line for two, three months just before eventually Telcom relented and the East line went in. And the line went in, we had um, really good modems. Those, those were fast modems running at 14.4 kilobits per second on a line. Now I should just talk a little bit about modems of that era. Um, telcom circuits, there is no ways that Telcom SAPT would respond to a call out if your leased line connection, if you complained that it wasn't working properly and was running faster than 1200 bits per second, their circuits would not work faster than that. And at one stage we had, in order to try to get faster speeds, we actually got a, an SAPT modem, because it was just before <coughs> Telcom. And that was a 9,600 bits per second modem, and that, that was the limit. I mean, that really went like the clappers. The DigiNet was in place by that stage, but if you, want, if you were using analog and you couldn't afford DigiNet. DigiNet? DigiNet slow out? You know? Yeah. They have to tell people what DigiNet is. <laughs> the modem, the device, <coughs> that big. Whoops, whoops. Buttons all over the place, lights all over the place, and Telcom, SAPT, had to condition the line to try to make it work at 9,600 bits per second. So when we got these little modems, size of a little modem, and going at 14.4, this was cooking with gas. And they worked, they you know, went fine, beautifully on the international line. Then we had this issue of domain storms. And um, people might have read some of my postings a few years back on IOZ, um, neurotic about the domain name system, and you can think all thank you lucky stars that Mike Lowry doesn't run it anymore, <laughs> because I've lived through the slot. Late at night, response times, <coughs> five minutes on circuits that are supposed to be dead quiet, and the process that we eventually focused on, managed to diagnose, we had FTP software's monitoring system. FTP software from Massachusetts, USA, very good stuff. We looked at this traffic and running and running and running, and then we saw a, amongst other things, um, a domain query coming from somewhere out there, uh, not in South Africa, 
coming in to University of the Free State trying to look up a host name. University of the Free State ran its own primary server and had a secondary, two secondaries, might have had more secondaries, but two of them were at University of Natal. And they had been set up to say that they are sort of <coughs> brothers and sisters type of thing. So if the one didn't know, it referred you to the other. If the other didn't know, it referred you to the first. The domain system was down at the free state. I think their computers had been switched off or something had gone wrong. And the process worked something like this, that we could see a query come in and we could see the response that says, can't help you. This is to free state system saying, can't help you. Have a look at machine A at Durban and machine B at Durban. And we saw the request coming into machine A at Durban and the response going back, I can't help you go to machine B at Durban. And of course, B responded exactly the same way, I can't help you go to machine A at Durban. And by that stage, long before that had happened, the requester at the far end had got impatient, maybe it was a mail system or something or other, automatic system, fired off a second query to free state. And of course, when that response was going back, there were now queries going to machine A at Durban saying go to B and B saying go to A and it just went whoops, nuclear uh, reaction. And this was, I suppose, a result of very early domain name software. It was a result of configuration files, a result of heaven knows what else, but it was an absolute disaster. So at least let me defend my approach. That when I ran the CRZA and the ZA, I said, if your damn name servers are not working, I'm not registering you, period. That's it. That's where it comes from. Fixing it was, I really don't recall how we fixed it. Um, COZA, um, it fell under my wing when I took over as Unionet Manager in 94 from Vic Shaw. Um, COZA had been set up really early. Um, ZA started in about 1990, 1991. Obviously only when the connection to the internet was established in, in November 91 was it actually visible, but we had to have an internal name service system. Um, the, no one took over COZA, so it fell under the wings of the Uninet office, which then became my wings, which then became an impossibility, because the internet in this country really got going in, in 95. Uh, the, the first commercial ISPs were in about 93, entered 93, early 94, um, and then it really started taking off in, 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 in 95. And it became an impossibility for us in the uni net office, whose job was to look after universities and the university networking, to look after the COZA as well. Um, my secretary was spending far too much time on the phone trying to explain to people how to set up name servers and how to this and that and the other. Um, I could not get the ISPs to take it over. There was a sort of situation where one ISP said, yeah, no, we, we'd love to run it. But another big ISP would say, over oh, my dead body does that ISP run it. I think it was because of access to potential customers and things like that. Obviously, it was of great commercial interest. Um, uh, William, I'm sure, will remind me about <laughs> a threatening email I had to send out. And at the end, I said, stuff this for a joke. Uh, I'm going to dish out COZA names at random. It'll be five letters. It'll be a... Uh, consonant, a vowel, a consonant, a vowel, a consonant, and you can like it because we cannot handle this job. And eventually there was a meeting of ISPs in Bromfontein. The minutes that I have of it says 12th of August 95. A chap called Anthony Brooks facilitated it. Uh, uh, probably a couple of others. Outfit at the time was called IDAT and African Internet Development something something. <laughs> and can tell us if he wants to. And then Uniform took over the reins, and they've run it since then. Um, these were early days. There's lots more to talk about. If you want me, I'll carry on for hours, but I, I think I'll stop, and I will thank you. <laughs>